All right, um, I'm risk-free, as you can uh, tell. And my speak is entitled Encryption for Programmers. But it's kind of misleading, because I'm only talking about the very basics. So if you know anything about cryptography or encryption, you are going to be bored. This is where everyone stands up and leaves. I guess everyone is ready to learn something then. Uh, I'm just going to basically go over a um, very, very short introductory um, and explain the difference between a code and a cipher. Because a lot of people think that a code is a cipher and vice versa. They don't know the difference between the code and the cipher. And then I'll just go into some concepts and examples of current encryption schemes. And just very briefly, I'll go through those just to give an example of the different types of encryption that is out there. And then I'll go into uh, the legalities. Uh, believe it or not, there is some legality over encryption programming, especially in the United States, anyway. OK, what is cryptography? Cryptography is defined as language and math techniques for securing information now. That is very straightforward. Basically, it's telling you how to keep your information secure, be it data, files, messages, anything like that. There are many parts to cryptography, encryption, decryption, obviously, and steganography, which is hiding messages inside other messages or hiding stuff inside graphics. And I won't go into that in this talk, but I probably will go into that in another talk for a different con, maybe. Uh, so what is encryption? Uh, it's the conversion from plain text to ciphertext. And plain text is basically your English, whatever you want to type in English or whatever language you speak, your native language. And you want to convert it to something else that's unreadable just right away. And that is called your ciphertext. Now, historically, uh, encryption has been used primarily for military communications. Um, dates back down to Julius Caesar, hence the Caesar cipher, which I'll talk about later. And yeah, historically, it's just for military purposes until the more modern eras. Uh, but for now, uh, we use it for digital signatures. I'm sure you've heard of uh, PGP. Uh, we use it for voting, uh, for cash transactions, PayPal. I'm sure you don't want to send your bank information unsecured. And we basically use it uh, everywhere now. You'll see it anywhere. All right, the difference between a code and a cipher. This is something that you probably want to get down if you don't know already. Now, a code is like a code word for something. And it's just using um, words or phrases and substituting them for something else. Like saying, um, let's go to the docks. Would, might, you might mean, let's go get a beer or something like that. So it's just regular substitution. It's very, very easy. Now a cipher, on the other hand, is the actual, uh, it's the actual changing of the data into something else. And you'll see that in all the examples that I give. And it's normally controlled by a key, such as a keyword or uh, some random letters, or if you use a random number generator or something like that, and which you'll see later on. Now, there are two main categories of encryption algorithms, and that's uh, symmetric key algorithms and asymmetric key algorithms. Symmetric key is a private key, and I'll talk about the differences between private key and public key. And just some examples, DES and AES, if you just want to keep it in the back of your mind when we go through these. And asymmetric key algorithm is also known as public key, and that's like RSA stuff. All right, symmetric key encryption, uh, I said it was uh, private key encryption, meaning that there's uh, one key, and it's uh, private, so you don't give it out to anyone, otherwise they can encrypt and decrypt all your data, and that's kind of pointless if you give that out. And um, it works uh, with blocks and streams. And I'll, I'll discuss blocks and streams in the next slide, and so don't worry about that right now. 
And again, examples, AES, DES, and RC4. Uh, DES and AES are block ciphers, however, RC4 is a stream cipher. I don't discuss RC4 in this talk, but I do discuss DES and AES. Uh, for blocks and streams, okay, the very basic principles of a block cipher is that it's operating on a fixed length of bytes or bits or however much stuff you want to encrypt. Now, most of them just use like 32 bits or 8 bits or 4 bytes or whatever it may be. And it's normally uh, controlled by the, the secret key. And you'll see this later on in the examples that I'll go through. What happens is you take the, the plain text, however much of that you want to encrypt, say, four bits, and then you'll take four bits of the secret key, and then you'll combine that into the block cipher to get your ciphertext. And it'll do that for each part of the message. Whereas a stream cipher, it operates on one bit or a byte. So each bit or byte in the message will change. Uh, asymmetric key encryption, uh, like I said, is public key, and this is probably what you're more known for. So, uh, for the pre regarding uh, the previous slide, uh, how does the block cipher uh, transmute the plain, plain text and a key? Does it overlay the key on top of plain text? It'll combine it with like XOR, and you, you'll see later. I ha I'll show you. Okay, asymmetric key, like I said, is public key. This probably you're more familiar with um, PGP and stuff, where you see people posting the little signatures and stuff with their PGP keys. And it uses two keys, the public key for encryption, for encrypting stuff, and your private key for decryption. So only you can decrypt the messages. And it's also used for you know, digital signing. Um, there's also more, obviously, more uh, DSA and Algamol. I don't talk about those, so I'm just throwing them out. Uh, these are the um, number of, well, the types of um, algorithms I'm going to discuss. The Alberti or the um, Vinier, the Rot13, they're all very similar Caesar ciphers, and I'll discuss those like right now. Um, the other ones, uh, don't worry about until later. And one-time pads, you might n think uh, not useful for um, computer use, and you're probably wondering why. So I'll get to that later. <laughs> All right, uh, the Alberti, I guess, is one of the one of the first Caesar ciphers. It was um, made in 1466 by Leon Battista Alberti, and after that came the um, Vinier cipher, and they're, these are all sort of going off the same principle of substituting the alphabet as seen in this example where they'll just move stuff over. And probably the most familiar one is the ROT13. I'm sure everyone has heard of it. And basically what it does is just rotate 13 places. I mean, you don't want to use that for anything. Well, polyalphabetic means just one alphabet. So it's just moving the one. It just uses one alphabet, like the English alphabet or something. Does that help? All right. Um, an interesting thing about the um, ROT13 encryption, I don't know if some of you have heard about it. Um, in 2001, a cryptanalysis, um, a Russian guy, he uh, broke this um, company's ebook security. And what they did was uh, encrypt all of their documents in ROT13. So <laughs> it's kind of pointless, but it's uh, included in the, um, the Adobe eBook development thing. So uh, I don't think you'd ever want to use that to encrypt anything. <laughs> uh, see, 1466, the Alberti uh, encryption was made by, and he was a, re a Renaissance scholar. Uh, in 1586, um, the Vinier cipher, he was a French diplomat and a cryptographer, and it's a good example of bad encryption. Uh, this is a simple, uh, very simple Perl program I made. Um, you can see by the example, you just, you're substituting all of the, the, the alphabet, and you can either input with a file or whatever you want to do for your input, 
and you can export it to the screen or you can throw it into a file or do whatever with it. Um, now when people refer to ROT26 like you guys are talking about up here, uh, ROT26 doesn't use any encryption because what it'll do, it'll rotate 13 and then it'll rotate 13 more and that just brings it back to the plain text. Uh, it's no use. However, um, you can use ROT47 which will do it by 47 places and might throw people off a little bit more than they might think uh, 13. All right, DES. I'm sure you've all heard of DES and EFF's great, great cracker for this way back. Uh, it's very insecure, very insecure. Uh, it was first published in 1975 and in 1977, the federal government standardized it. Um, at the time, it was fairly good. It uses a 64-bit block size and a 56-bit key size. And these things will be explained more as I explain how it works. As same with the, uh, the structure. It's the structure is called Feistel. It's made after Horst Feistel. He designed it. Uh, and it uses 16 rounds of this. Now the Feistel structure, it, all the operations of the structure are very similar to each other. And it only requires a reversal of the key to be able to encrypt and decrypt. So it's not too terribly complicated. And it uses repeated operations such as bit shuffling, which are called P boxes, like permutation boxes. You'll see this uh, all the time when you're dealing with cryptography. And nonlinear functions, these are called S boxes uh, for substitution. And you'll see S boxes and P boxes all the time. And linear mixing using uh, the exclusive OR, that's used quite a bit as well. Uh, this diagram shows how DES actually encrypts its stuff. Um, what it first just does is takes the first block and it expands it using the sub key or an, a key that you uh, used and it mixes them together to form 16 sub keys and then what it'll do is it'll substitute those as you can see by the S boxes and then it's divided into eight pieces and they'll go to work substituting and changing all the data in there Uh, the half block is the half part. It'll it'll split the message up into. What do you mean, what is it, what is it it's the your message because oh, okay. it'll split up the original message into however much you want to specify, and it'll take half of that, and it'll use your key for the other half. And then after it's uh, in the substitution boxes, it'll go on to uh, permeate into a fixed P box. And DES, like I said, is very insecure. Don't use it for anything anymore. Uh, the next one is AES, uh, Advanced Encryption Standard. Uh, sometimes it's also called the Rindell. I don't know how to pronounce if I'm pronouncing that right. What is it? Rindale. Okay. Um, and it is the U.S. government standard right now. Uh, it's first published in 1998. In 2001, it became the standard. It uses a 128-bit block size, 128, 192, or 256-bit key size, so you can change those if you need to. And it uses a substitution permeation structure, not the Feistel structure, which you previously saw. And you can use 10, 12, or 14 rounds. All right. Um, AES begins with a 4x4 array which is often called the state. Now, the first thing that it does, and this is kind of like pseudocode. Uh, the first part I, I wrote, subbytes. That could be a function that you use. It's a, a substitution with a lookup table. Now, I'll go into detail each one of these steps. This is just kind of an overview. Uh, and then it goes into shift rows, which is transposition, and then mixes and combines all of the data. And then it'll add, add a round key. Uh, the final round does not mix the columns. 
Okay, the first one is subbytes, uh, and it uses uh, linear substitution. Basically, what it's doing is going to make up the lookup table. It's just going to basically copy this stuff over. And then it's going to actually shift the rows. As you can see by the numbers, it just shifts it one row over. And then you go into the mixed columns. Uh, use the fixed polynomial as seen in XOR, which uh, it'll help that uh, transform it. And it's going to add the round key. Now, uh, it's going to take uh, the, from the state, it's going to take the block. And then, it, then from the key, it'll take that and XOR those two. And then finally, that'll be added into the lookup table with the round key. And the, an implementation for this, if you want some source code for, to do with this, um, I have this site listed here, and I'll put this up on my website, and I'll have the address for that stuff uh, at the end. Um, but this code is BSD licensed, and it includes a Visual uh, Studio workspace and source code with assembly source code if you want that too, as well as a, a Windows DLL if you ever want to do Windows stuff with it. Uh, the next one is RSA. It, it is asymmetric, meaning it's public key. And it was the first uh, cipher for um, signing and encryption. And this is kind of confusing, this part here. Um, it was first described in 1973 by Clifford Cox of the GCHQ. Um, but in 1977, uh, Ron Rivest, uh, Addie Shamir, and Len Alderman described it too. Now, we didn't know about the Clifford Cox one in 1973 because he was working for the British government at the time. And he, while he was working on it, it was classified information. So he didn't actually get the claim to fame for this one. And this is sort of how RSA works. You'll take, and it uses prime numbers, because prime numbers are sometimes very hard to calculate unless you have a lot of computing power. OK, this is uh, first how it works. Prime numbers are hard to calculate. Well, I'll get back to you on that. I mean, I don't know how, I don't know the general like math of how how people know math, so I'll just get back to you on that. Yeah. Um, well, just to kind of just to give a quick answer to this question. Okay. Um, it's not the numbers themselves that are hard to calculate, but what you're looking for is um, multiplying two numbers together is really, really easy, mm -hmm. but figuring out the factors of a number is really, really hard. And that's sort of the premise behind RSA. That's the hard part to calculate. Yeah. I guess I should say I'm not an expert at this stuff. I'm just I'm learning this stuff as a hobby and stuff and I'd I just like to show some people like what you can do and stuff. Okay. This is how uh, RSA works. The first prime number that you calculate we'll we'll call it P. And you're either going to keep this secret or you're just going to delete it. Now, if you delete it, you want to make sure you delete it securely and not just throw it off somewhere. Your second prime, uh, we're going to call that Q, and we're going to keep that secret or delete it securely again. And for N, uh, we're going to take P times Q, uh, which is your modulus, and that's going to be public. So it, it, people can see that if they need to. Now, E uh, is going to be public exponent, which again, Public, people can see, doesn't matter. And D is going to be your private exponent. Again, private, get rid of securely. 
Now your public key is actually E and N, and your private key is D. Now to encrypt M, which is your plain text, you're going to take M to the power of E mod N, which will give you M to the power of 17 mod 3233. Uh, to decrypt, it's basically reverse of that stuff there. And on the bottom, you can see the examples, just if you want to encrypt simple, simple um, numbers. Um, RSA needs to use padding schemes. Otherwise, you'll have, it'll be too easy to calculate the numbers. You've got to throw in some stuff to like, um, take people away from the actual numbers that you want to calculate. Because if you have M, as in M on that page, as 0 or 1, your output will always be 0 or 1. And that will easily give it away unless you use some kind of padding. And low exponents may be less than your modulus. And if you use low exponents, uh, that'll be too easy to decrypt. So that you don't want to use low exponents. You got to make sure you have high exponents. So uh, computing power is definitely preferred with this. And for digital signing, it's quite easy. Um, you just take a hash, and you can use anything for that, any kind of uh, hashing you want to do, you, if you want to make your own. And take that to the power of D, your private exponent, and mod N, which will give you X. I take X to the power of E mod N, should give you the hash. If it doesn't, then you know it's been tampered with. Now, Bluef or Blowfish is my favorite, because uh, in 1993, Bruce Schneier made it, and he made it public domain, which is very cool with all of these. Uh, it has a block size of 64 bits and a key size from 32 to 448 bits. And again, it has a Feistel structure, like seen before, with 16 rounds. And you can see the implementation on Bruce Schneier's website. He has plenty of source code links. I know there was C, C++, there was Python, Perl. I think there was even COBOL up there. I don't know how they did that. And that's basically how Blowfish works. What it'll do is it'll split it up into eight bits and throw those into an S box or substitution. It'll substitute the stuff. And then we use modular addition from the output of those S boxes. And then it'll go into modular addition with all four of those S boxes. And it'll do this for each part of the message. And then it'll, that'll give you your output with all the modular addition parts there. RC5, uh, there are plenty of RC codes. Um, RC stands for Rives cipher or Ron's code, as uh, Ron Rives made it. Uh, it was first published in 1994. has a block size of 32, 64, or 128 bits. The key size up to 2,040 bits. Again, it has a Feistel structure with 12 rounds. And RC5 and RC6 are both proprietary for RSA security, so source code is documentation is not as good as you would want it to be. Uh, again, it's a block cipher, same with RC5. Uh, however, RC6 was made by Ron Rivest. Um, let's see, I think it was Matt Robshaw. Uh, OK, I forget their, their full names. Um, the block size of 128-bit, key sizes of 128-bit, 192, or 256-bit. Now, one-time pads, they're very simple to implement. And you're, I don't know if, how many of you know about one-time pads, but computers don't use, like, pens and papers and stuff. And that's how this stuff is mainly implemented. And basically, you need a pad. So what you'll do is take, say, 
a Scrabble bag with all the numbers and letters, and you'll take out the, the letters and write them down on a pad for how many you need on your message. Say your message is hello. So you only take out that many number or more if you need more. And see, it has to have the same length at least. Otherwise, there's no point. Now, the drawbacks to this is you have to have it completely random. If it's not random, then it'll be easily brute forced. And again, you need secure exchange of pad. If you don't have secure exchange and somebody looks at the numbers that you picked out, what good is it going to do? And it's one time use. I mean, you can't reuse the same numbers or letters that you used in the first part. Otherwise, you know, it's not going not to be any use. And that goes into integrity. Now, if uh, one time pads, the integrity deals with all of the, uh, the secure exchange and the secure generation of the letters and numbers. Make sure all that stuff is secure so no one sees this stuff. And uh, this, these are uh, simple uh, how to do this stuff. So we're going to take hello and we're going to give a numerical value to each letter in the alphabet starting with zero. And then say we take out five letters from a Scrabble bag and we get J E P S W. What we're going to do is take the numerical values of hello and J E P S W and we're going to add those together. Now you might think, well, 11 plus 15 is more than 25. So what you do is you just come back and start at the beginning and keep going, which gives us then Q I A D J. That's how you encrypt the stuff. Now to decrypt it, it's basically the reverse. Where we were adding to encrypt, we're just going to subtract the letters. So. See, um, again, when you subtract them, they might not come out to the end, so you just got to go back to the alphabet and keep going. Just got to go through it, and that should give you hello. Very simple, it, and I just wanted to cover it because it is a very basic way to do stuff, and it's very unbreakable as long as you don't have, you know, the same stuff over and over again. Now the legalities. This kind of surprised me a bit. Um, there are no US import laws, thankfully. However, the US did sign the Vassinar Agreement. And this agreement is really long, so I did not even bother to read most of it. However, uh, they do have something in there called um, the general software note, it was uh, in December 1998, I believe, and it says software is not included as restricted technology if it is generally available to the public, such as, you know, if you make something and you give out the source code, then that's generally available. Um, however, if your code is or was made before 1998, then it does not fall into this category. So you can't export it then. And how, there is a lot more laws than just what I've described. Um, so if you want more information on that, um, the two websites here. The first one is um, this guy, uh, Bert uh, Koops, is his PhD website. He went through almost I don't want to say every country, but a giant list of countries and actually got the laws for each country. And it's huge. It's a great website, by the way. And then, obviously, the Vassner website, vassner.org, um, for more information. They don't give out, actually, too much information on their website. So, I mean, they do some, but you can't find the explicit laws on there, which was very surprising to me. So, any questions? I know there will probably be some.
U.S. export controls? No, I haven't. Because the NSA was all worried about PGP getting out. And so I, this was actually before those laws, but I, he just released it to the public, really. Yeah. And it was kind of like a screw you, because once it's out there in the public domain, who's going to stop them? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anything else? I know I kind of went through this fast, but I'm tired, not much sleep. And I'll throw this on my website, uh, and you can download it. I'll have all the links up there and stuff if you want to take a look at it. Anything else? Um, you'll see email is the biggest one. I mean, a lot of people want secure trans transfer of your emails. I mean, you want people reading your emails. And another one um, that I know is, is very useful is instant messaging. I know a lot of companies that use instant messaging within the corporate environment. And a lot of the stuff is encrypted. I know AIM is encrypted and MSN, they use SSL for all their, their instant messages. Um, but I think email is definitely the, the biggest thing right there. Any more? The other application for email is signing. Yes, yeah. That, that, work, that comes in with uh, PGP and stuff. Yeah, yeah. How are one time pads unbreakable? Um, well, with the random generation of your pad, your random letters, and if, say, if you use, I'll go back to it. Say we use uh, J E P S W and we pad it with the rest of the alphabet just randomly. I mean, it's really hard to guess this stuff, and especially when you're adding and subtracting the numerical values. And you can, like I use 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You can start with any number. So you can just change the numbers and pad it, and it's really hard to break. <laughs> I've tried it definitely many times. They actually just used to be used a big ping pong ball cage, and they used to rotate it. Problem is, is with a lot of a lot of and with the nature of computers, you have your pseudo number random generators that that they're eventually it may be millions and millions and billions of times, but they're eventually going to start spitting out the same exact thing they did before. Yeah. Whereas this is complete, you know, th this is totally random at the human level. Actually, there's a problem with that because when letters like X and W and Q are coming up. Just as much as other letters, the, the human operators falls back in saying, "Oh, we got an X recently, so X is rare. We shouldn't be seeing it again." Um, and a number well, that of just created a crib for somebody that wants to decrypt it. Huh? What? That just created a crib for somebody that wants to decrypt. It, it just threw off the frequency distribution, so it wasn't actually a real time. Really random. Uh -huh. so, the, the human factor is usually the more stupid, uh, stupid uh, human factor. <laughs> There's no problem with the World War II Nazi encryption because they signed they put the opening for each uh, letter with Heil Hitler and uh, I think uh, Ocean Number Alice. I had not heard it. Like each other letters, you just look at the first two lines and you got you basically Wow. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, about the stupid human factor too. The, the, Half the reason that we found the cribs to break the Enigma was because a lot of German operators were just fucking lazy, and they would do the same thing on on the, on the wheel cipher wheels all the time. And eventually, it's just like any encryption. You pass enough traffic, eventually they're going to be able to, you know, do frequency analysis on it and figure out, you know, what's what or XOR back and forth. And, yeah, yeah. And that's basically how they broke it. If they, the way I understand it, if anybody else wants to correct me, go ahead. If they would have actually random generated each, you know, wheel point every day, we would have never broken it. 
but apparently, you know, due to human factors, the stupid human factor, they, they kept on using the same damn thing over and over again. And it was stupid human factor, but they also transmitted the key with the message. Oh, really? The Enigma, they actually would clear text the cipher key with the message. It was double encoded, so you would, you cipher the message with itself, and then you cipher it again, but you sent your key along with the message. Hmm. So that's how we, had, they don't send it at the beginning of the message, it's sent in the middle of the message, and part of the message is sent clear text. So the, way, the method that they sent it also made it easier to break, but they changed it several times throughout the war as well. Hmm. So there was uh, some spy, uh, Spies and um, the U.S. get the names, but they used um, horse uh, racing results as one time had for a certain city. And so they would always have, and that would basically it would be security for obscurity, because if you didn't know what city they were looking at, uh, you wouldn't know what code they were using. If you didn't know they were doing that, uh, you wouldn't know what code they were using, but that was a way for them to. Uh, That's not what I'm doing. It's still a one-time pad. Well, what would you say it would be then? <laughs> yeah, you're you're right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else? All right. Uh, I guess that's it then. Thanks for listening. Uh, we want to close up the uh, scavenger hunt, see how well this works. Gina, uh, does anybody know where Gina is? We want to close up the scavenger hunt and get that going. Also, uh, myself, Nate, how much one? Do we have a winner for anything but Ethernet? Was that ever determined or was it kind of like a. Uh, figure that out. Once the once that back wall is broken down, I'll get get started a little bit. Oh my! Kind of, sort of, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. It'll it'll be a few minutes. All right. Um, I'm I'm gonna kind of get started here, everybody, just because I want everybody to be able to get home. I know a lot of you have a really long drive. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, whatever gets you off, man, whatever gets you off. Um, I'm going to get started then and just tell everybody thank you for coming to Nauticon. We had an official headcount, I think, of about 242 people, including presenters, including our, our, our presenters and staff, and mind you, uh, so, so some of the staff pre-registered, pre so that's about almost 250 people in the door, which uh, well blew past last year which is awesome. Uh, a lot of you who, uh, who here uh, was, their, was their first Nauticon? Wow. Wow. Just, uh, any, anybody have any weird way they found out about Nauticon? Like I know somebody said, I heard it from a friend or I heard it. 
It came to me in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> how many Linux fest? Yeah, how, how many people here went to Linux Fest? <laughs> uh, Ohio Linux Fest. That's pretty cool. And when are you doing Ohio Linux Fest again, Greg? Uh, 9.30.06. Okay, September 30th, 2006, Ohio Linux Fest down in Columbus. Live penguins. There will be live penguins. <laughs> Hell yeah. And uh, I, th I think, are we going to uh, do the favor of uh, running the after party for you again? We'd love to do it. All right, yeah, we're going to do a Nauticon after party. Um, which oh, kid Dancing yeah. Penguins. And uh, Ohio Linux Fest tends to have lots of free drink tickets. Yes. Lots of free drink tickets. Uh, and if you're lucky, Unholy. Unholy, where are you at, dude? Where are you? Are you? Uh, anyway, good, he's not here. He was like taking off his shirt and doing calisthenics and shit. It was crazy. Um, but anyway, uh, first I, I do want to give a few big thanks. Big thanks to Greg and Entunet and all the people he brought in to get us our uplink. We didn't have to rely on Hotel DSL. He gave us a 900 megahertz, 3 megabit link that uh, you know I think worked pretty damn well all weekend. So big, big ups and internet. Um, they're, a, they're a local group. Please, please support them. We had 600 port scans Saturday morning. 600 <laughs> port scans Saturday morning. <laughs> Impressive. Um, I also want to thank the, Sh the Shmu group. They, they did us a real big favor and, uh, loan and loaned us a couple projectors and, and threw a lot of money our way and came, and came down to support this event themselves. And I really want to thank them. Also, big thanks to the Hacker Foundation for also supporting the event. They uh, gave us some money when we really, really needed it to help this event go off. Um, what do we have there? Ah. Uh, some, some final reg numbers. Uh, it turns out we actually had uh, 12 people pay 100 bucks to the door. If you paid 100 bucks to the door, thank you very much. We rock. But also big thanks. We had 204 people pre-register when it was all said and done. 177 of who showed, showed up. Thank you very much as well. We sold about 114 shirts. And be, before taxes, we, we made about $13,000. So that's a good, a good amount of money. But what you need to know right off the bat is that, you know, we out, you know, even though I hate paying taxes, I do. And about 12 to 15% of that, I have to figure out which is going to go right back to the city of Cleveland and right back to the state of Ohio. So I'm never going to see 12 to 15% of that. Two to two and a half more percent is gone with PayPal fees, credit card fees, all that kind of stuff. So right off the bat, I'm not seeing 20% of what you gave me. Um, on top of that, this space is costing us about $1,500. I uh, went through about $1,000 in printing costs. The badges cost about $600. Programs cost about $650. Um, the food for the console came out to about, you know, about eight or $900. Um, for the few guests that we did uh, give them complimentary um, hotel space to, you know, that comes out of it. Of course, I have to keep my wonderful staff. I have to keep them in a room and fed. So, you know, uh, let, let's give a quick round of applause to all the great staff and volunteers. Um, the, the rule for my core staff was that they had to work 20 hours to, uh, to, you know, basically make it happen. And all our volunteers volunteered at least six hours a time, a lot of them. Like David Lauer, I know, put in a hell of a lot of time, got us our quarter watt FM transmitter for Nauticon Radio. So, thank you, David. Um, and again, thanks to you know all of our other sponsors real quick. Uh, you, you know who they are. If not, I'll be happy to remind you, but big thanks to them. Do we have uh, results for the scavenger hunt, Gina? I know we had like three or four entries, correct? Got four. Four entries. All right, well. Can we do that right now? Yes, I can. All right. This is the Nauticon scavenger hunt with Gina. Um, on top of being in med school and having a life uh, basically put together on her own time and ran through me. So big thank you to Gina. <laughs> she rocks. I'd have failed out of, of, of med school by now. <laughs> so what were our three teams? Um, let's see, we've got Strider, who has a few items. We've got a team composed of Morbid, Slade, Low-Tech, and Risk-Free. We've got a team composed of Imperium, Illusion, Calvin Destroyer, Number Two Console, and Baby Huey. And a team composed of Semic Nordic, XMR, and Tom, or Trigba, which would you prefer? <laughs> and who was our overall winner in this contest? Like I said, we've got a few more points to be decided, uh, uh, and a few highlights um, of note. 
someone actually managed to apparently procure Honda's, the Honda Civic that Colonel had stolen from him prior to Nalakan II. Uh, evidence of this based on the signature next to the I received this item. So apparently Colonel got back his stolen car. Or I think that's bullshit because <laughs> I have it. <laughs> yeah, but they at, oh, least got, they at least socially engineered him. So I gave them full credit for that. And that was Sam Ranch Nordic. Um, however, they also have one more other item. Uh, can you come up wherever you went? What do we have here? This is a combination item from what I understand. Okay, we still have the coffee cup. You have the, the, the coffee cup? Several. Lots of devices. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Including, oh God. Place size basketball boots with a nipple shield. <laughs> <laughs> That's both cool and disturbing at the same time. How many points should I give them for that? How, how many points, okay, out of what? What is the maximum? There isn't a maximum. Two points. Do I hear? Do I hear three? Do I hear three? Do I hear three? Three, five. <laughs> Give them what you feel it's worth. Negative five. Seeing as he's the only person who's actually shown up in a bathing suit without clothing underneath it, and I don't count the pieces of paper and stickers as clothing underneath the bathing suit, I'm going to give him 300 points for that. All right. <laughs> wow. Your mother's going to want to talk to you later on, dude. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Which means that uh, in third place, Imperium Illusion, Calvin the Destroyer, number two console, and Baby Huey. All right, guys, where are you at? Have some more crappy raffle tickets. <laughs> Spend them wisely. Who's next? In second place, Morbid, Slade, Low Tech, and Risk Free. Yeah! Yeah! Come on. In first place, Samak, Nordic, XMR, and Tom. All right. Who, who, who got second place? All right, here, have some more crappy raffle tickets. Uh, what, what? And we have three, three people that were in first place? Yes. Uh, you folks are going to Nauticon for 20 bucks next year. All right. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. All right. We got that done with. Please spend those raffle, raffle tickets wisely. Um, what else do we have to say? We also had the, anything but Ethernet. Did we ever come to a consensus on if anybody actually won that? I guess not. Hey, myself? Myself. Myself. Did anybody win anything but Ethernet? <laughs> NYC spent about 600 on their party. Represent that. And also Freaknik. You, you guys really tore it up. Brought it down here. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Did everybody have a good time last night? No. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, what happened with anything but Ethernet. What happened with that? Not a whole lot. Uh, let's see. We had it was it was another it was another two horse race this year, and uh, one entry uh, part of it walked off overnight, and the other entry um, didn't really run much. So <laughs> it didn't. Um, by default, success. What? My entry. Your entry. Oh. Yes, um, Eric Pinzer wants to enter his audio system, which I'm, I'm alleging because I, I can't type into it and see it come up the other end. It's not really a, a data network, but he's, he's got like, you know, uh, modulated audio and transmitter and baseband audio and then digitized audio and then through this cable and that. And he's, he's you know, got quite an impressive pop count going for, for the, the sound of my voice yeah. to reach your ears. Um, but uh, I... I, I I really don't want to count it. He's course staff too. Yeah, yeah, he can't win. But honorable mention, actually, let, let's give it up for Eric, because he really busted a lot of ass this weekend to make sure this sounds good. And also Ted, Ted from Media Archives, who did all of our videotaping. I mean, this guy's awesome. Buy his DVDs. They, they are available. Please buy them, because he's got his costs to cover too, you know? 
Um, and, we, and he is going to actually provide us with copies of the video, and we're going to put those on our website for y'all. And we do have the videos done for Nauticon 2005, which we're going to be putting up on the website. If we owe you a DVD set still because you bought it, let me know, and we'll, we'll try to hook you up. Jason Scott was really nice in actually doing a, the final set of post-production and DVD burning. So uh, we'll, we'll hook you up. Anything else? All right. Um, did, does anybody have any questions or anything they want to bring up real quick before we raffle off about Nauticon or maybe a good, good or bad experience? Yes. Well, since we had issues with the E164 um, contest, yes. I'm proposing that we do the raffles and any non-winning raffle tickets we raffle off for the zipper adapter. Okay, that's cool. We, how about if we throw that in the mystery raffle? Whatever you'd like to do. All right, bring it up here. We'll throw that as a mystery prize. Also as a mystery prize, um, Ilanka, uh, our, our presenter, was very nice to give us a, a copy of her book, The Mammoth Book of Secret Code Puzzles. Now, the cool thing is, um, this isn't even going to be released yet for another six weeks. This is actually a preview edition for the, the UK pre-release on 427. Uh, she's doing this just for Nauticon, and she'll be very happy to autograph this for you. Um, so big thank you to Ilanka for providing this. We also have uh, a t-shirt that was giving us, uh, given to us by uh, um, Rick from Geek Mafia, uh, yeah, he was really nice, and hopefully you can you got a chance to talk to him. Um, but it was really great to have all these people kind of throw some cool stuff at us here at the last minute. Um, what, 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 did anybody have like a really cool experience here, something that they didn't expect that happened? No. Freestyle oh, the freestyle contest of 522. Yeah. Who who was hearing me like go on about Donkey Punch and all this other kind of crap and <laughs> lose your lunch? That was art. That was art. Yes, yeah, sir. I was supposed to meet somebody here and realized I was talking to him for well over like three or four hours until I finally called him and he answered. Probably. Right next to you? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. What he said is he was yeah. looking for his buddy he wanted to meet with. and you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I got some sleep. You got sleep. I did too. I actually, I, I got some good sleep too. Oh, oh, also, Nauticon Radio, that rocked. Well, I mean, we were going, we were going over IP, we were going over asterisk, we were going over FM. We were every, we were in the UK, we were in Cali, we were everywhere with that this year. That's awesome. So big thanks to Jason Scott for helping us set that up. Um, now, I, it kind of feels like this year was the Jason Scott Con edition of Not a Con, but really, you know, he really put a lot of effort into this because, uh, as I said in the program, I had some really serious personal issues I've been dealing with this year, and uh, he really kind of came through to help. Keep, keep us on track. But more so than that, also my wife, Jody, um, where is she at? Oh, shit. She's like, oh, God, fuck you. Um, jo Jody did a really good job of, of kicking me in the ass because there were certain times this year that I, I said, I don't really want to do this. I cannot do this. I do not have the ability to, 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 to do this. I'm not strong enough. And she made it happen and gave me a lot of shit and said, you are going to get this done because people need this. People need us. We need to put this event on, so that that's why not kind of happened because uh, she she made it happen. So, and uh, she was the one to say, even though we, we you know we lost money and lost a little more money this year, it's worth it, and we're going to have you back for uh, not a con 2007 right here. So if you want to book, well, don't book your rooms because we don't know where we're going to have it. Uh, but we're we're going to try. Is is this time pretty good for everybody? Because I know a lot of people. You know, I know this is like the same week as Cansec West. Um, Palm Sunday. Palm yeah. Sunday, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go. Well, I'm. A, I'm. A, I already have ten one-way tickets the to hell already, <laughs> laminated. Um, but I, I guess what I'm saying is, if you have any, if you have any suggestions, compliments, complaints, feel free to email me. And likewise, what we like to do is kind of what Rubicon did is uh, we want to put your photo galleries and your write-ups on our front page so everybody can see what went on. So if you have a write-up in text or HTML or a link in your blog, let us know. We'll link to it, good or bad. I want to know. I know we've had some, some good criticism that's actually, even though it's hard for me to take criticism, I really appreciate it because it means we can make this thing better. And, and what the, the, the final thing I want to say before raffling everything off, and I say it every year, but it's true. Not a con is not is what it is because of everybody else that participates. This is not me on a stage. This is not really the staff on the stage. This is all of us coming together, doing something cool, having a good time. Um, you know, I thank you all for behaving. I know it's really hard to do, but you know, I, I've been taking Pilosec for 18 months now, and I haven't had a stomach upset all weekend. So thank you very much. 
Um, let, let's give away some of this crap, shall we? Do I have an assistant? Let's get rid of some of this junk and then we can all go home, break down, well, <laughs> no, uh, break down the con area. We also do have some stuff. Do we have any food left in the con suite? Yep. Well, we'll if you want something from the con suite, we got like a, a, a whole pallet of Pepsi left and stuff and Coke. Uh, what do we have to give away first, K-Dub? All right, I guess we'll go down the list. Oh, also, before I notice, K-Dub, how old are you? Uh, I'm 18. He's 18 years old. Uh, a couple weeks back, he was saying, check your mail, check your mail. I'm like, okay, why? Uh, K-Dub actually dumped into his own pocket and threw out a couple hundred bucks to help us. So he's actually one of our biggest sponsors, 18 years old. And uh, when I keel over from smoking too much, he's going to be the one to keep this running. And also big thanks to Domo Kuhn, of course. So what are we raffling off here? This is the Bash scripting books. Yes, sir. All right, let's get this over with because this is pain defined. Okay. Get creative. Get creative here. We're going to need uh, somebody else want to help us out and pass out these prizes to folks. Got to get another st staffer up here. Oh man. Oh wow. Wee. I'd blow through it. I don't know how that would look. Well, I <laughs> I don't think it really matters. Hopefully at, at Burning Man if I can go this year I'll turn this into a geodesic dome or something like that. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> Doo -doo. Oh, Todd puts on the staff shirt. We have ticket number 0591. 0591. Anybody? No. no, of course not. Next. Yeah, this is going to be like this for the next half hour, and then we just start throwing shit in the audience. Uh, 0556. 0591. Oh, 05, uh, 0591. Close enough. <laughs> oh, actually, 0551. I shit you. Apple scripting book. 